so we are the Lancaster University Comedy Institute. But, much more importantly tonight, this gig is in collaboration with the Defined Adventure Society. Now on your table you've got a QR code. If you follow that QR code, you will go to their Just Giving page where you can donate anything big or small will be greatly received. Now the society raised money for a drug that's uh, drug? Yeah, drugs. We all like drugs. Uh, for a drug that's being developed on campus to kind of combat the symptoms of dementia, which is a fantastic cause. So first of all, can we give them a round of applause, please? Back doing stuff in front of a live audience again. Clothes on this time. That's <laughs> um, that back. Um, so, yeah, this is, like I said, the first time back. So, who people come with tonight? Who have you come with? My girlfriend. Your girlfriend? So, it's date night. Um, yeah, Whose turn was it to pay for date night? Whose <laughs> turn it was, you call an absolute cracker. <laughs> <laughs> Which is all the more reason to sit in there. Anyone else who people have the table here? Sorry, that's the final message. Hey, did you come with? Thank you. Friends? I tell you, friends are really nice. Has anybody come with flatmates? No flats tonight, I can understand that. Oh! You come with What's the worst thing your flatmates do that annoy you? One of you. Don't look at them, look at me. <laughs> They're not here, I'm here. In the green hoodie, what's the most annoying thing about your flatmates? I'm not that flatmate. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking of the lady in the glass. Right. Me, me over here. Um, yeah. I don't know. Ben. Oh, look at them. <laughs> I've got some questionable flatmates. What they do is what they don't do, they don't do their own right now. They just leave it piling up like some sort of colouring Jenga. It's absolutely awful. And I, the kitchen is filthy. I've seen slums on National Geographic that are tidier than my kitchen. I mean, I know they're shitting in rivers, but at least it's not spag bowl cemented to the hole. And I'm not saying I want to go and live in a slum. Of course, that would be silly. Blackpool's just down the road. So anyway, yeah. It gives me back doing stuff again in front of a live audience. Sort of the past 18 months have been an absolute write off, COVID and whatnot. Um, I was listening to the radio the other week and they were using the phrase the past 18 months, a ridiculous amount. It's the, the phrase the past 18 months has been used more than a 40 year old virgin subscription to Steam Trains Weekly. It really is. <laughs> um, somebody, somebody called into the radio programme. And they were sort of, they did a quiz, you know, they wanted a quiz with the ridiculously easy questions that everybody still gets wrong. Um, and they finished the quiz and the, the, the presenter says, so what are you doing this evening then? And then you get, the lady goes, well, I'm going to be really naughty and order a takeaway. Now, first observation is, when middle-aged women get to the age of 30 or 40, their definition of naughty goes from actual naughty stuff to, so, you know, getting a magnum out of the freezer on a Monday night. For a man, when you get to 40, your definition of naughty goes to, you know, sleeping with the neighbour. So, there's a big difference there. So, you know, she goes, yeah, we're going to order a takeaway. And the presenter goes, well, you know what, we've had a tough past 18 months. You deserve it. I mean, house confinement, the trauma of 140,000 people dead, but a chicken chow mein, it's all alright. <laughs> Uh, what does that leave me? Uh, yeah, also, people are using it as an excuse for things, and it's starting to get my nerves. During the Euros football tournament, I heard somebody saying, well, we deserve to be well, we've had a tough past 18 months. It's not just us. The French were also in the tournament, and they've, they've had a tough 223 years since they became French. <laughs> um, anyway, we don't need an excuse to get our next act on. First off, we're kicking off with a game called Merry Berry. And for this, I need Chloe and and Tristan. Please welcome Chloe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what this game entails is these two are going to be in a fairly normal location, which you, the audience, are going to give to us. These two have been able to produce a fairly mundane scene for about 30 seconds. But I say yeah, Mary Berry. At that point, they're able to make it as weird as they possibly can. So can we please get a location for this scene to take place? Train station. Train station, nice. Cinema, Cinema lovely. Any others? This other room? Supermarket. Supermarket, nice. Tiny. 
one more. Brothel. <laughs> is that what you see as Monday? <laughs> like that thing. I think it was supermarket. So you can see the market. Take it away. Monday night. I think we need some uh, carrots as well. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that for the spike bowl? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've got the celery already and yeah. the, uh, the corn mints. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, how many do you think we need? I say three carrots. Yeah, three they, carrots. they are on offer, so. Oh, just four. Four. Let's get four. Let's be naughty. Yeah. <laughs> naughty. <laughs> merry, merry. Um, so, carrots are on offer. We've got the salary. Um, what do you think we need next? Uh, I think we're going to need the nappies. The nappies, they yeah, are very, yeah. very important for the bolognese. Yes. Really. Um, um, well, I mean, what else can we provide that nice, uh, crisp, crunchy layer between yeah, yeah, yeah. and also not let any of the liquid seep through? No, that's, I mean, that's very important. We like dry bolognese. Yes, yeah, yeah. dry. Right. Right. <laughs> um, speaking of that, um, two kilograms of sand. Sand? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, that's <laughs> Sand. See the trouble. Yeah. The trouble with sand. I find that it's it's a bit easy on the old digestive system. I, I prefer gravel usually. You know, <laughs> you've got to work out. Yeah, but it feels a bit too much like fibre. You know, it, you know, it feels like something that I'm meant to have. Sand feels like a treat. <laughs> um, yeah, but beyond yeah. that, I feel like that's most of the sort of covered. Um, what, do we need anything for the dog? Oh, the dog. Um, I was thinking some. Pepper would be good on the dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would what would season the, the meat quite nicely would be some soy, uh, garlic, chili, and uh, maybe just a bit of extract if you want hair. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say dandruff is, is always uh, a good spec. Yeah, you can sort of sprinkle it on like Parmesan cheese. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking uh, I think we should uh, make sure there's, there's some skin in there as well. I think it's so bright. I can just get some skin from the garden. <laughs> oh yeah, no, dig it up. Dig it yeah, up. Dig up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. in the same way as I did with the tightness issue. Uh, first time I put mine on it was absolutely fine, went to sleep, slept on it weird, hand went purple, not ideal. Waking up at 3am all alone, sad, confused in a new place with no sensation in my hand or something like uni kick off I'd hoped for, but at least I could pretend to hold hands with someone. It's <laughs> tragic. Um, being a fresher was kind of nice after lockdown, so I didn't really enjoy online school um, because I'm not very techy. Uh, being on Teams every day was a bit of a challenge because um, I'd always like try and change my background, but I'd keep being middle class. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's also just kind of losing the school vibes. Like when you're online, it's just not the same. You don't get to like chat to people and have those little interactions through the day. Like I remember being in a year nine geography class. And somebody said, um, excuse me, miss, what's Palestine? 
and the person next to them said, oh, it's uh, those little white packaging balls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that just does not happen on Zoom, does it? Like, you just can't get that kind of atmosphere. Um, but uh, it's been quite nice in recent years to be like a non-techy person, because a lot of old tech has come back, things with buttons that I can understand. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the uh, Polaroid cameras revamp. Uh, but I did have a moment with it where I kind of understood the older generation's hatred of our generation uh, misusing their tech when I took a picture on it, showed it to my friend, and she went, Oh, cool, it's loading. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was probably, Freshness was probably most nice of things because I learned to drive because I find a strange instructor. Um, she was nice, just weird. Um, she would say things to me like, You would have failed for that when I did literally anything. Um, but it was quite nice that she was strange, because even though it was strange, she helped me out because I'm not very good at like chat, you know, and you're like sat waiting for the red light to change to green so you don't have to sit in the silence anymore. But she helped because she was strange, so she just lowered the bar for the chat. Um, for example, I once got into the car to start the lesson and she just turned to me and said, I've just had my dog put down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. Oh, that's, that's awful, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I was playing fetch with it and then I went blind, so I took it to the vet and put it down. Drive on when you're ready. <laughs> I was not ready. <laughs> but I have actually driven since I passed my test. Uh, I'm pretty nervous to go back behind the wheel, to be honest, but I think my technique is just going to be put the hazard warning lights on and do what I want. <laughs> it's not my fault. Um, but, uh, yeah, I haven't really driven because my best friend Ben passed his test and he had a car, so it just made sense for him to drive us places. He started off as like the absolute classic first time driver, getting whiplash from looking at all the mirrors and doing all the checks. And then he kind of calmed down, became more confident, and started to get real whiplash. Um, <laughs> kind of deteriorated to a point where I had to say, look, can you just put one hand on the wheel, on the motorbike? Um, but, you know, in fairness to him, I'm not dead, not dead, um, and, you know, being in the car with him, having that time together was super nice, uh, made me really great for our friendship, having all the memories flash before my eyes so many times, um, but we had some really great times, uh, like, we went to the beach, I love to be by the sea, I love the sea, not so much when I can see it out of Ben's window in the car fills with water, <laughs> but uh, for me, the main reason to go to the seaside is the seaside slots, the amusement slots, the two-piece slots, there's no high and low in the human experience, quite like spending two hours and 20 pounds to win a soiled emoji keyring. Um, but I'm kind of always surprised at myself that I do like the slots because I'm a tight lord. Um, I like value for money, so I'm going to drop out of uni. Um, but I need to stay to finish my marketing degree because I need job security and money. Uh, I don't choose for passion, no one does. Um, as for me, I just need the money so that I actually have a future that's worth living for. Because uh, I really want a kitchen island, so you know, well, that's what gets me out there. Um, but I do have a backup plan if marketing doesn't work out. Um, I'm going to sell my body <laughs> to science. <laughs> With people. Um, I really like, like psychology experiments and stuff. Uh, I always think those are really fun. Like, I remember, um, even from a young age, like my mum introduced me and my sister to the marshmallow test, which is this kind of cool thing where you ask young children if they want one marshmallow now or two later. And the idea is that if they say two later, they're going to be like successful in life and stuff. Um, wish that could be me. Um, but uh, I don't really know how it kind of works. My sister's response was, are the marshmallows pink or white? <laughs> don't know what you do with that. Um, but uh, even just in the short time I've been at uni, I've actually signed up to some experiments. Uh, tomorrow I'm having an EEG brain scan. Woo! Yeah, going to get £10 for it. Don't get jealous. Don't get jealous. <laughs> um, but more than anything, I'm kind of going because I need some medical advice about the nerve damage that my freshers responded did to my hands. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have got another stand-up act for you. Uh, please welcome to the stage, John Lee. Hello. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hi, so I'm John, and I'm going to do some stand-up for you uh, this evening. Uh, so, when I sat down to write this stand-up set, 
I thought I would take some advice that is given to a lot of people who write stand-up. Now, the advice I need is not move out of your parents' house. <laughs> no, the advice I need is people say, talk about a topic you're passionate about. So, I started thinking to myself, what, what topics am I passionate about? Topics, topics, topics. Mm, I don't sellotape. <laughs> no, can't do a set on sellotape. We never get to the end of it. <laughs> so I started thinking, okay, topics, what am I passionate about? Uh, the Bank of England? No, <laughs> can't do a set on the Bank of England. That won't get any interest. <laughs> so I kept thinking, topics, what am I passionate about? Um, drilling underground tunnels? No, can't do a cell drilling underground tunnels. That's boring. <laughs> but then, I had an idea. I know a good topic that I'm passionate about. Heavy metal music. I was expecting some woo there. <laughs> Does anyone here listen to heavy metal music? <laughs> so welcome to my set on pop music. <laughs> no, uh, so, uh, we might start with, so John, what are the biggest heavy metal bands out there? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so the biggest heavy metal band is probably the band Metallica. Now, Metallica, they are huge. They have sold over 100 million records. That's right. They used to work in HMV. <laughs> but, uh, Metallica, uh, let's, let's get a picture up of them, shall we? <laughs> One, direction. One Direction really let themselves go after Zane left. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, another great big heavy metal artist is Ozzy Osbourne. Now, we all know Ozzy. Ozzy, he again is massive. He's sold over six million singles. That's right. He used to work as a bus driver. <laughs> now, I love Ozzy. Not in that way. <laughs> no. I mean, I love him sexually. <laughs> Now, it's interesting. I actually have read Ozzy's autobiography. Uh, I read it during my freshers' week when I first started uni, because I'm a fun guy. <laughs> and interestingly, in his autobiography, he said that one of his biggest influences was the band The Beatles. Now, The Beatles, obviously, they were enormous. They have sold over 600 million albums. That's right. They were very successful. <laughs> um, but, interestingly, the Beatles were one of the early pioneers of psychedelic rock. Rock about drugs. Uh, and a classic example of this is their album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So that album is loaded with drug references. And it includes the song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which some people say has a drug reference in its title. You know, they say it spells out LSD. Lucy, L, Sky, S, Diamonds, D, LSD. Uh, however, some people would say that's just a coincidence. They didn't mean it to spell out LSD. It was just an accident. However, <laughs> I think those people are missing the big picture. I think there are lots of Beatles songs with drug references in the titles. 
take the song Hey Jude, H J, clearly stands for huge joint. <laughs> Or take the song Strawberry Fields Forever. S F F clearly stands for splits for free. <laughs> or take the song I Want to Hold Your Hand. I W T H Y H clearly stands for incredible weed. Totally heavenly, you all hallucinate! <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> I've done the research. I've laid out the evidence. That's my theory. Q-E-D. Quality ecstasy, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you very much. The next track is like an improv game, which is basically where these wonderful people are going to make it up on the spot. Uh, this improv game is practice. <laughs> Alright. Uh, it's called Excuses, Excuses. For this game, I need Fred. Harvey and Tommy. <coughs> so in this game, Harvey is late for work and I'm his boss. He has got to give me three excuses as to why he is late, which are going to be decided by you, the lovely audience. The first excuse is relatively normal, the second is pretty weird, and the third is simply batshit crazy. The excuses that you give are going to be mined by Johnny and Fred. Harvey got to got to guess them. Is that one? Dodgy cable. Um, these guys will mine them and Harvey has got to guess them. When he guesses them right, if you could clap so he knows to move to the next one, that would be absolutely amazing. So Harvey, if you could please leave the room. Um, <laughs> Outside. Can you please? Yeah. A relatively normal excuse as to why he left work. Please do shout. He slept in. He slept in. Nice. Any others? Bus didn't come. Bus didn't come. Traffic. Tra traffic. Uh, he slept in. We'll go with he slept in as excuse number one. Excuse number two is a weird one. Window shopping. He was window shopping. Nice. He was window shopping. He found a dead cat on the road. Found a dead cat on the road. He found a dead horse on the road. <laughs> <laughs> nice, he found a dead horse. He found a dead horse on the road. And we're going to top that now. The third is he is an absolutely batshit crazy one as to why he's late for work. He was abducted by aliens. Abducted by aliens? His feet went missing. I think we're going to go with the aliens. <coughs> So, do you remember the movie? No, number one excuse is the um, overslept. Perfect. Number two, uh, dead horse. Dead horse. <laughs> Three, uh, aliens. Aliens. Perfect. Um, normally we shout to get him back in, but I don't know here, so can we go grab him? Perfect. <laughs> Wait, come on, what is it? It's not the third time. I mean, it's every year this week. I, I couldn't, I, I'm going to watch it broke, okay? And the springs and the coils have been falling out, and it just didn't wake me up. I used my watch to help me wake up the same one. And it didn't quite wake me up. The alarm clock didn't go off. You've already given me that one twice. I've already gone to a board meeting while you're late. What are you doing? What are you doing? I was riding a horse on the way to work. You were riding a horse? Yeah, he was over and died. You expect him to do that? What happened? Pictures? 
Left about eight-ish because it was starting to get cold. Just got off the phone to Dominic. One of Dominic's clients was killed in a head-on car crash last week. Sleep well. <laughs> fucking brilliant. I'm not going to be counting sheep anymore, Grandma. I'm fucking counting bumper pieces on the road. Went off to sleep. Ding. Took them six hours to scrape around the car. <laughs> make jokes like that because I also drive. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, let's get on with our first game of the second act. Uh, this game is Who's Line, which you're very kindly giving us some suggestions for. So can I please get on the stage the wonderful Harvey and Yeston. Oh, <laughs> so for this scene, we're going to watch one. So for this scene, we're going to be in crisis for these two people to solve. And at any point that they're choosing, they're going to pull out one of the pieces of paper, read it out, and work it into the scene. So can we please get a crisis for them to solve anything? Funny, not funny. They're trying to make it funny, so what do you mean? Crisis, please. <laughs> the boat sinking. The boat sinking, nice. Uh, being chased by a policeman. Being chased by a policeman? They lost your little sister. <laughs> they lost your sister. You've lost your sister, I really like that. Okay. <laughs> You've lost your sister. <laughs> it's your job to <laughs> Take it away. Who? Uh, yes. No. Why not? You're going to keep an eye on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I drank milk straight from the cow. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that is something I can get behind. <laughs> I don't even know. In all honesty, this has felt like such a, a just infinity war. But the car, but this is going on for so long, it feels like an end game. <laughs> Yes, and Harvey. Next up, we have another amazing stand-up for you. Um, I asked her yesterday three adjectives to describe yourself. She said, done, tired, but here. So, thankfully she is here, because she's on the set list. Please welcome to the stage, Charlotte John. Thank you. Hello, yes, I'm Charlotte. I'm a PhD student, so I'm probably the oldest in the room. Uh, that does mean I'm a millennial, sorry. But I'm like a younger millennial, so I've only been around long enough to kill uh, napkins, mayonnaise, and uh, dogging. So. I'm also a seminar tutor, uh, but it was only after teaching online last year that I finally plucked up the courage to actually give stand up a go. There's something about standing in front of a team's call, basically talking yourself, talk, talking to yourself since no one turns their fucking camera off. <laughs> Cracking terrible jokes to try and keep your students engaged and because of your desperate need to be liked and dying on your ass every single time that makes standing in front of actual flesh humans seem a little less terrifying. This is my uh, fourth year of teaching first year undergrads. I teach the same module every year and I love it. But the older I get, the scarier it is. I know the content like the back of my hand because that's where I used to read it from. I know what works and what doesn't, but the kids just keep getting younger, and that is terrifying. When I started teaching, I referred to my students as kids in a kind of motherly, affectionate way, you know, because I see my role as being very supportive, trying to help them through first year, prepare them to spread their wings into part two and all that wholesome shit. <laughs> now I call them kids because that's what they are, literal children. This year, my students weren't even alive during the biggest tragedy of the 21st century so far. 2001, the day steps broke up. 26th of December, it ruined Christmas. I was more upset that day than when my mum left us for the vicar. Did you just laugh at my childhood trauma or was that just a joke? You'll never know. Some of my students don't even know who steps are, and that's an even bigger tragedy. Some of you might have got the subtle tragedy joke there, but not many of you did, and that makes me feel a deeper shade of blue. <laughs> that joke would kill you all in at least six years older. So I do sometimes struggle to communicate with the youth of today, um, but even without the generational divide, I think I might struggle because I've just always been old. Thank you. Um, <laughs> when I was in primary school, uh, at a great time, I used to sit on a bench. My classmates would come over and ask if I wanted to play, and I'd say, no, thank you. I'm busy composing symphonies in my head. <laughs> when I was in year six, I wore a suit, trousers, shirt, blazer, to school on a non-uniform day. I was mistaken for the deputy head. A 50-year-old man. <laughs> So yeah, childhood Charlotte was <clears throat> a little weird, but my cringiest memory, don't know why I'm going to share this with you, but it was for the year five and six talent show. I was in year six and I decided to participate with a song, and so I naturally chose Stomp by Steps, which is one of the top three singles from their third album, Buzz, with two Zs, not to be confused with their single Buzz with three, obviously. So I was just going to be singing along to the Track on CD, it's all good, grab the mic, get on stage. And then I realised I made a terrible mistake. As you know, the introduction to Stomp is very long. So there I am, all alone on stage, all eyes on me. And the intro gets going. Join it. six years older, we'll be having a party right now. <laughs> Thankfully, eventually, we get to the verse. Thank God for the weekend, now is the time. When it gets to the bridge, the music shifts something within me. 
and I start doing the choreography that I've been teaching myself at home in the living room. Every time when my work is done, I get my party on. I call a few friends of mine, make sure I'm not getting by. I know we're gonna have a real good time, yeah. And then the music just takes over, and I start doing the official steps choreography. acting as a mirror for Yeston. So whatever moves Johnny does, Yeston has got to copy them in real time and work them into the scene whilst they're solving the crisis. So can we please get a crisis to be solved? Still time to donate. Please. Yay! Yay. 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 Y
Uh, this next game is called Foursquare. Funnily enough, I need four players, and those people are. This is the hardest bit remembering. <laughs> Fred, Yeston, Tristan, and Chloe. <laughs> This game is incredibly hard to explain. So, here we go. This game is called Full Square. Woo! The scene plays out in the front two people in the square. The back two are technically irrelevant until they're here. Each character will have their own genre for the scene. So can we please get a genre for Tristan? A film genre for Tristan. Horror. Horror? Nice. So Tristan, your genre is going to be horror. Now the way the game works, is the genre is dictated in the scene here by who is standing in this space on your left. So when Tristan is stood here with the genre of horror, the scene playing out here will be horror. And Fred will also be a horror character because he is here. Now whenever Fred stands here, he will remain the same character that he was when he first stood here. <coughs> horror. If you lost that mind. Um, so the, the genre will change like so. Rotate. So there is someone new here, stood here. So whenever Yeston's genre is going to be, it will be the genre for the scene. So can we please get a genre for Yeston? Romance. Romance, nice. So romance. Okay, rotate. A genre for Chloe, please. Documentary. Sci-fi. Sci-fi, documentary. Any others? <coughs> Sci-fi, you mentioned. Okay, <laughs> documentary. And rotate. And for Fred, a genre, please. Action. Nice. And rotate one more time. Perfect. So we're back with Tristan, whose horror is... Horror! <laughs> <laughs> Tristan, whose genre is horror. Um, I can also change up the scene by switching the character around. For example, Yeston, Fred, switch. Now what's happened here is the genre is still horror, because Tristan is here. But whatever the character Yeston has from standing here in the first instance will be the character he plays when here. So say Fred was stood there when Tristan was first here, your genre is? Uh, action. Action. <laughs> Yeston would be an action character because he'd never be able to see that film. So if you swap back, if you're lost, honestly I'm so sorry, but <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get the gist of the game. Can you you'll get the gist of the game after you get going. Um, is everybody happy? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Take it away. The zombies! The zombies are here! They're right outside the door! Good. <laughs> good! 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 I'm good. I've had enough of this house game, Brian! <laughs> Can I just 
can I just make a disclaimer that just because I'm the world's most dangerous animal does not mean I'm a predator. <laughs> <laughs> no, not kind of, well, not that kind of predator, which is still a deadly predator. Okay, two, okay, one. 